Hey, howdy everybody. Let's carry on with our discussion about uncertainty in the subsurface and for the purpose of subsurface modeling. Now, I previously talked about what uncertainty is, sources of uncertainty, how we represent uncertainty, and now we'll talk about how to calculate uncertainty. Afterwards, we'll talk about how we practically sample uncertainty. Uncertainty, uncertainty, uncertainty. So, Let's talk about how we calculate uncertainty. And to do this, I will give you a very, very simple two-dimensional schematic conceptual problem here. And so what we have here is a area of interest with this rectangle right here. And we have a location with an area of interest, which is noted as U vector one. At that location, we would like to estimate the porosity in the subsurface. Now we could anticipate that there's probably a trend. I got to tell you, 90 something percent of every subsurface model I built had some type of trend in it. Subsurface has trends. So we have a trend. And so what we have is we have a global uncertainty distribution at this location, just based on the fact that we said that this is a Depositional setting of a deep water lobe. We know something about deep water lobes. We know something about the processes involved in depositing and preserving them, the depth. We have adjacent fields. We have a whole bunch of different information sources. And from that, we can infer a distribution of uncertainty, our PDF, for the porosity at location U1. Now, but at the same time, we model the trend. And so we know that not all of the porosity values are from that distribution are equally likely at all locations within the model. There are going there are going to be different locations with high and low values. This happens to be a location with a high value from the trend. And so we have decomposed part of the variability as we discussed before into the trend. And so now we're dealing with a residual from the trend the mean value, the central tendency, is shifted up because we're in a high location. And we anticipate that the variability should also decrease because part of the variability of the entire problem is now captured within the trend model. We're working with the residual variance. Okay, so we have shrunk the uncertainty a bit by using a trend. But we don't just have a trend. We also have conditioning data that are nearby. Data point number one, there could be a whole bunch of different data points available to us, and we have to impose that conditioning data. We're updating our uncertainty, our variance, the residual variance, now given the available data, data that's been transformed to residual values. And so we are now looking at a reduction in variance due to the fact that we have information correlated neighboring data. Now I've talked about previously the fact that we can simplify a problem if we only have one data to relating the variance, the creaking variance directly to the variogram value. That's what I've done here in order to do the subtraction of the covariance, but that's assuming just one data. We could assume we're solving the entire creaking matrix in all of generality, but in general we know that we will further reduce the uncertainty represented by that local variance because now we have data that we can impose. Primary data, secondary data with co-creaking, whatever it is, we can use the spatial continuity model and the creaking system to further reduce the uncertainty. Now, we've solved the problem of trying to get uncertainty at one location, but we're going to need to represent uncertainty jointly over the entire area of interest. And as I've mentioned before, we'll do that by using multiple scenarios and multiple realizations. Multiple scenarios where we change the modeling decisions, the parameters that are used in, in the model. Multiple realizations given constant decisions and parameters to explore the space due to spatial uncertainty. So now we have our set of scenarios and for each one of the scenarios we have multiple realizations that we're working with. Now you could back up and say, okay, Michael, what would happen if I just didn't use scenarios, if I didn't use realizations, what would be the consequence? And here's a list of the consequences if you don't use scenarios. 
If you don't use multiple scenarios within your uncertainty model of the subsurface, you will implicitly assume perfect knowledge of the primary and secondary data calibrated from remote measures or indirect measures from the subsurface from well logs, maybe seismic information that has been inverted to get to some type of property calibrated perhaps to say porosity. All of those inputs will be considered to be perfectly certain if you do not use scenarios. If you don't use scenarios, you assume that all of the univariate distributions are perfectly known, that the distribution of, uns of porosity over the entire area of interest or permeability or whatever it might be are perfectly understood. The mean is known, the variance is known, the P10, the P13, they're all known perfectly. The spatial continuity model is perfectly known. Any one of us out there who have done Veragram modeling or built training images for MPS know that those are generally pretty uncertain. The bivariate distributions, the relationships between variables. If you're doing cloud transform, you will be relying on reproducing that distribution perfectly. If you're doing co-located co cricking you will use a correlation coefficient after the Gaussian transform of both of the properties, the primary and the secondary. You're assuming that's perfectly known too. So if you multiple scenarios, then you're relying on ergodic fluctuations to characterize the uncertainty in the input statistics. And that was the good old days. Now we're in the modern age and that's just not sufficient. So we got to use multiple scenarios. And what's the cool thing? People have got the message in general, we're seeing multiple scenarios being used all the time. What about not using multiple realizations? What would be the consequence of doing that? Well, that's just as bad because what'll happen is you will not have spatial uncertainty. When you have a data configuration like this within an area of interest, at locations away from the data, you could have a whole range of possible outcomes that could be possible. And so you could have what's known in the business as a stochastic island, a set of high values within the constraint of spatial continuity that are away from data that are just representing the fact that yes, it could be high, but in the next realization, it would also be equally likely to be very low. And so if you don't use multiple realizations, you're going to freeze in models that have stochastic islands. You're not accounting for spatial uncertainty. The input statistics, their fluctuations. Ergodic fluctuations are still useful to us. If we don't do multiple realizations, we won't see those fluctuations. We'll just have a single representation of the distribution for each model choice, but it could actually fluctuate and ergodic fluctuations are part of our uncertainty. Response surface. Now, this is a big problem. You build a response surface. Now, we'll get into this shortly exactly what that is, but all it is is we want to understand the relationship between the model choices, choice one, choice two, porosity, average, permeability, variance, choices in the model input parameters and the response and the response could be recovery factor oil in place something we use to make a decision now when you build a response surface what you're doing is you're taking a limited set of possible scenarios you're building the models you're calculating the transfer function you're trying to understand the relationship between model choices and impact on the model response because there actually are stochastic islands because multiple realizations have things that change, like ergodic fluctuations up and down, that gets frozen into your response surface and your response surface will in fact become rough. You happen to have a stochastic island of high between two wells, you get a high recovery factor or high flow rate, and it appears that that scenario is a good scenario. But it just for that realization, it was good. If you took multiple realizations, you get a better image of what's going on. You have to account for multiple realizations when you build response surfaces or it's going to be too rough. The uncertainty space is vast. Let's consider the space of uncertainty. Now, we could take two variables of interest for static modeling. Um, it's very typical to be focused on porosity a lot. 
we may consider permeability, specifically when we get into concerns about flow, but we could consider two properties that are of course going to be usually impactful and that would be the average porosity that impacts volumetrics. The variance of permeability, while it directly impacts Dijkstra Parsons, heterogeneity, it's probably going to be important too. Well, if you do a, if you try to sample the possible range of values between just these two properties of interest, if you sample with three different levels, high, mid, and low for both of them, the result is that we will have nine possible scenarios to work with. Now, remember, you need multiple realizations per scenario. Now, but that's not the case. Typically, we're going to have multiple variables we need to work with. In fact, you can imagine it's not atypical to be working with seven, eight, nine, or ten possible variables that you should consider. And if you do a three-level design, well, the number of scenarios is equal to number of levels to the power of the number of variables. So if you tried to work with 10 variables, three level design, that would be about 59,000 scenarios, 10 realizations each. We're talking about about 600,000 models that we would have to run if we were trying to sample and understand all of these possible combinations in the hyperdimensional space of 10D. That's a huge uncertainty space. And even then, we're not sampling that well. A three level sampling rate Imagine if we were looking at the recovery factor versus permeability, it could be complicated. It doesn't need to be just a simple type of behavior of function. And with three level design, we're probably missing a lot of features. We're missing a lot of features in between all of these points. And due to the curse of dimensionality, these points get further apart and our coverage gets worse and worse and worse as we move up through multiple variables. We talk about the curse of dimensionality when we talk about multivariate modeling. So the uncertainty space is vast. I don't say that to suggest that we should give up. We do our best. We try to sample the uncertainty space, but we do it with a degree of humility. And I think that that's important. Don't be overconfident and think that we can just tackle it completely comprehensively. We should recognize the fact that we should have humility. Okay, we represent our uncertainty with an uncertainty model through scenarios and realizations. Now, any time that you try to ask a new question, you got to consider all of the scenarios and realizations jointly. So what's the porosity at this location right here? Sample the porosity over all of the realizations, over all of the scenarios, accounting for the probability of the scenarios. If they're all equal likely, it's not a problem. You just pull them together. You may have to weight them if there is some difference in the probabilities associated with each one of them. If your question is the volume, um, or I mean the average porosity within this volume, which is a larger volume, then you would go ahead and sample that over all of the possible scenarios and realizations. But for every question, we go back to all of the models and we query all of them in order to build the distribution of uncertainty. What about if we're dealing with the recovery factor between well one and well three? Maybe well one is an injector, well three is a producer. We're trying to do a water flood, we're sweeping it. We would have to run all of the models through flow simulation, perhaps a sector model, just wrapped around those wells so we can at least get a pretty good idea of what's going on. But we would have to run them all through the transfer function to do that. Now, something that's very important and a lot of people fall into this is for every single question, we have to rerun all of the models. People are tempted to do model ranking and I will talk about ranking later on. They will try to rank all the models and say, Based on this calculation, this model's best, this one's worse, this one's in the middle, and they'll rank them. The problem with ranking is ranks are sticky. People forget the criteria by which the model was ranked. And for every new question, you really need to run all of the models again. The model that was the best model for porosity right here is not the best model for recovery factor right here, and is not also the best model for the average porosity within that volume right there. Okay, so next time we'll get into sampling on the uncertainty model. How do we sample explore uncertainty? What are the practical methodologies we use in order to accomplish that?
As always, I hope this was interesting and useful to you. I appreciate all the good feedback. If you have questions or comments, go ahead. Super busy these days, so I, my apologies if I don't get back to people immediately. My email is easy to find. I don't always check all the social media platforms, but you can always find my email. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm also the Geostats guy on Twitter, GitHub, and YouTube. Hey, thank you very much. Eh? You all take care.